Hello, I hope this is better now. I'm very sorry about this, uh, this glitch with uh, technology. Uh, so I'm delaying this uh, uh, second part of uh, energy and climate change. Uh, welcome everybody uh, to uh, Accounting for Science in International Arbitration and International Law. Uh, yesterday, uh, for those uh, uh, who were not here with us, uh, that is to say all of our panelists uh, and uh, some, some, some people in the audience probably, uh, we heard from Jean-Marc Jancovici. Uh, for those who, who don't know him, uh, Jean-Marc uh, is an engineer uh, who heads the leading think tank and the leading uh, consultancy uh, in uh, climate change adaptation and energy transition in France. Uh, he's also uh, a professor at uh, L'Ecole des Mines in Paris and uh, a member of uh, uh, France's High Council for Climate, uh, which is the body uh, that uh, uh, advises the prime minister on uh, climate change adaptation in France. So uh, one of the foremost uh, individuals uh, on the scientific and engineering front on the issues we have to deal with. Uh, uh, so before we get started, I'll, I'll just provide a very brief summary of insight that was given to us on, on science's lessons on physical reality and the often uh, mentioned objective of achieving uh, green growth uh, because this was the subject dealt with by Jean-Marc uh, from a uh, physical and engineering and scientific perspective. Uh, I'll go very quickly uh, through uh, five points uh, that came out from this presentation and that uh, uh, I consider to be very important. Uh, point number one uh, is that basically, uh, and this may seem obvious, but we have to pause for a minute to think about it. Uh, prior to the industrial era that began basically uh, with the, the steam machine and, and coal, uh, there was no economic growth whatsoever. Uh, our modern world still today uh, is basically based on fossil fuels. It was first coal, then uh, uh, oil and, and gas for the most part. And those fossil fuels are basically uh, what Jean-Marc Jancovici calls food for machines. Uh, that is to say, those fossil fuels uh, enabled us to build machines that made all of us uh, iron men or iron women, that is to say that with those machines, we have multiplied, multiplied 10 times, 100 times, sometimes thousands of times, depending on the industry and the type of machine or physical force. It is those machines fueled by fossil fuels uh, that made it possible for all of us to be present at this webinar, to sit behind a desk, uh, to take holidays and to take uh, uh, to enjoy the benefits, for instance, of uh, socialized uh, healthcare in in many uh, in many countries. Uh, in other words, uh, our world relies on uh, bas basically on uh, energetic slaves. This is the way uh, uh, Jean-Marc described our uh, situation. And if you look at uh, historically at the uh, the rise and fall of GDP per capita, it actually follows extremely closely the, the, the rise and fall of uh, greenhouse gases emissions, not their prices, the emissions themselves. Uh, second point, uh, Jean-Marc Jancovici uh, made it clear that no matter what we do uh, for the next 20 years as of now, uh, uh, the preferred goal of the Paris Agreement uh, to limit global warming uh, to 1.5 degrees uh, by uh, 2100 compared to pre-industrial uh, levels as foreseen uh, in the Paris Agreement uh, is very unlikely to be achieved and uh, 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 it, it most likely will not be achieved. Um, uh, uh, and, and also uh, for the, the, the remaining of the target, which is not to exceed two degrees, uh, if you look at, that our ver at our very limited carbon budget for us, but also for the next generation, uh, it will be very, very difficult uh, to stay on target. Uh, 
Uh, Jean-Marc also explained yesterday, and this is the third point I wanted to briefly cover, uh, the um, physical phenomena and scenarios at play uh, depending on the increase of average temperatures, uh, bearing in mind, and this is very important, uh, that the increase of our troubles as a society and as human beings is not a linear function or a proportional function of the increase of temperatures. Uh, what I mean by that is that at a certain stage, a very small percentage point of increase could trigger really exponential uh, uh, consequences that we cannot foresee. Uh, what we do know uh, uh, most likely uh, is that it, it is, uh, if, we, if we reach three degrees of average uh, global warming, it is by no means guaranteed uh, for physical reasons that democratic regimes uh, could remain in place. At four degrees, and this is an example uh, given by Jean-Marc yesterday in detailed fashion, uh, in a geographical area that covers a big chunk of the tropics, one day out of two, uh, life will be basically unlivable. Uh, because basically you cannot sweat, you cannot evaporate transpiration. So if you're on the streets, one day uh, out of two, uh, uh, it, it would be mortal for you. Uh, fourth point, uh, uh, no matter what we do as of today, whether we care or we don't care about climate change, uh, an energy diet will, will most likely occur, either willingly because we're doing to... Uh, uh, substantial efforts to uh, mitigate the efforts of climate change, or unwillingly uh, in any event due to the diminishing access to uh, certain natural resources on which we rely heavily, including oil, which is more and more difficult to access and which no matter what people say is still at the heart of our economies and societies. In other words, according to Jean-Marc, uh, there cannot be infinite growth, infinite economic growth, as currently defined uh, in economic terms in a finite world. Uh, and fifth point, this is the last point I wanted to make, and still for physical uh, reasons, in the little time frame that is available for us to act, uh, innovations, whether we're, whatever innovations we have, uh, on their own will not be sufficient, most likely, uh, to mitigate the effects of climate change and generate sufficient energy for our modern economies. So uh, there's a mix of solutions to be developed that, that implies both what exists today in terms of uh, technology and innovations, but uh, relying solely on innovations for the future, given the time frame we have, uh, could, could turn out to be uh, a dangerous bet. So innovation is needed. Uh, but it cannot be solely relied upon. Uh, we'll, we'll cover four topics basically today uh, uh, with our wonderful speakers. Uh, topic number one will be the, the many faces of climate change. Topic number two will be uh, how, can, how can climate change be addressed uh, in investment and arbitration. And uh, uh, topic number three will be about a few specific examples of climate change investments and disputes. And uh, topic number four uh, will be about the modest uh, proposals we can make to address the issue. I say modest proposals because uh, obviously uh, what, we'll, what, what, what we, I think we see from those two webinars is that there's big distance between the intangible law of physics uh, and where we are in terms of economic theory and also the legal system, international law, and arbitration. Uh, also, uh, we will be building upon the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the Paris Agreement, the IPCC 6 assessment report uh, that came out uh, this very summer. Uh, um, uh, but our proposals, as I said, uh, will be modest because we're not policy makers, obviously, and also because as arbitrators, we have uh, powers that are limited, obviously, by the arbitration agreement. Uh, but still, uh, uh, this conversation needs to happen and, and seeing what the gap is between the harshness of physical reality and what we have today uh, is a way that can also make us optimistic uh, to work uh, to take the necessary steps 
all of us uh, in our respective uh, fields. So with that, I'll just briefly uh, introduce our speakers who don't really need an introduction because uh, all of them have been very active uh, on issues of energy, climate change and environment uh, uh, so that uh, uh, you all know them if you're interested in that uh, particular uh, topic. Uh, so uh, our speakers today are Annette Magnusson, uh, who's uh, co-founded uh, Climate Change Council in April of this year. Uh, prior to that, uh, I'm sure all of, uh, all of you know uh, Annette because for over 10 years, uh, she was the Secretary General of the Arbitration Institute of uh, the uh, uh, Stockholm Chamber of Commerce, uh, where she innovated quite a bit. Uh, we also have uh, Wendy Miles, uh, uh, QC, that's your official title, uh, <laughs> Wendy, I understand, uh, who's at 20 Essex. Uh, prior to that, uh, she was a partner at uh, Wilmerhill, Boy Sheeler, and Deba Voice in Plimpton. Uh, indeed, you also, uh, most of you, probably all of you know that she was uh, the co chair of the ICC task force uh, that established in 2019. Uh, the ICC Commission reports on uh, resolving climate change related disputes through arbitration and, and ADR. And our last panelist is uh, Jorge Vinuales, who's the uh, Harold uh, Samuel Professor of Law and Environmental Policy at the University of Cambridge. Obviously, uh, Jorge has published very extensively uh, about energy and environmental law, as well as climate change, in addition to his private practice uh, that includes roles as counsel, expert, and, and arbitrator. Uh, so without further ado, uh, uh, we're going to dive uh, into topic number one. At the end of the session, after we've done the four topics, um, uh, hopefully we have time for uh, uh, 30 minutes of uh, Q&As, uh, and, and you can uh, put your questions uh, in the chat, and, and we'll try, and our panelists will try to uh, uh, to tackle as many questions as possible. Uh, so let us get started uh, with the many faces of climate change. Uh, I think Annette will start uh, introducing this topic uh, uh, regarding the, the status of the, the, the recent state court decisions on climate change. And, uh, and, and Wendy uh, will, will take over uh, by uh, explaining uh, why in contrast to state courts that have issued quite a few decisions in the, the last couple of years on the issue, um, uh, we have not really seen popping up uh, the issue of climate change uh, pop up in actual cases in arbitration, as far as I understand. And, and all of the three of you can indeed, or the people in the audience uh, can actually correct me uh, if, I'm, uh, if I'm wrong. Uh, so I'll leave the floor to, uh, to Annex. Thank you very much, Eliseo, and uh, hello, everyone. Um, thank you for having this conversation. And thank you for, um, I must begin by saying thank you for organizing that part one of this webinar yesterday. Um, I don't know if I was the only one um, who had trouble sleeping after listening to Jean-Marc for, for, for that time. It was a very sobering exercise. I collected some quotes from him. Uh, Greenhouse gases comes from a hard drug, which is called energy. Uh, this is going to blow up democracies everywhere. Uh, and uh, one that sort of ties into what we were talking, we, we were talking about uh, this afternoon uh, is that we will have surprises and we will have to manage in real time that we could not see in advance. So it's really um, uh, an understatement of the year to say we are entering into uncharted territory. And with that, of course, comes um, potential disputes. So, it was really, really interesting to listen uh, to Jean-Marc yesterday. Uh, and um, um, I think, uh, yes, he gave us a lot of food for thought, uh, sobering to say the least. So I will say a few words then on sort of the, uh, the many faces of climate change from a, a, um, court decisions. And really, I will take a bigger picture in terms of the disputes relating to climate change from a very introductory level uh, when we talk about the many faces of climate change. And, um, you, I'm sure many of you on this uh, 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 webinar here now have, have heard about climate change litigation, sort of that it's spiking. And I, I, um, I was just in another webinar earlier today where Jorge was also there and talking about how 
investment arbitration and, and environmental components uh, associated with these investment cases are also increasing a lot. I think their term use was skyrocketing. So we see an, an, a greater presence of these issues uh, in different ways in disputes, uh, and that's probably going to increase going forward. And so I will say a few words then about how uh, sort of to introduce this topic, how does climate change appear in international disputes, sort of including in international arbitration? And what do we mean when we talk about climate change related disputes? What is that really? Um, and uh, to, to understand sort of the arbitration context, it's, it's good to start with the sort of state courts or the climate change litigation context and see what is happening there. Um, because again, it, that's sort of a very growing field um, and it's growing very fast. Uh, so far, we have seen in the registries that are available with close to 2000 cases that have been identified around the world that sort of fits under this umbrella of climate change litigation. Um, and uh, for example, the UNEP, uh, UN Environmental Program, um, they have numbers where they uh, uh, note that the climate cases has nearly doubled uh, in the years between 2017 and 2020. So from 1884 to 1550. Um, and I think this is something to take note of for all organizations. Uh, so, in particular, perhaps larger organizations that are active across across uh, continents, uh, and not necessarily only organizations in the energy sector. Uh, when it comes to sort of the analyzing the risks of being subject to climate change related litigation, uh, that's that's something to really put on the uh, on the radar uh, if you are in in a corporate setting. Um, but then going back to the question, what is the climate change related dispute? And there are, of course, many different ways of um, on um, unpacking what is embedded in that sort of concept. Uh, <clears throat> I think the Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change on the Environment, they do a very good job on this in their annual report on climate change disputes. Uh, and this is a research institute associated with the London School of Economics. And I really um, recommend their annual report on climate change litigation, where they talk about the strategies and the arguments and the impacts of cases on climate change litigation globally. Um, and really, uh, a climate change related dispute could be any dispute where climate change makes itself known in one way or the other. So it could either be that climate change is central um, to the case, and this is something that appears to be growing. <clears throat> so here, uh, the, the climate change issues were decided by um, really looking at climate change law at, at the center of the case uh, and relating to climate science or cl cl climate change adaptation or mitigation efforts. You could see the climate change sort of transition or challenges right at the center of the case as such. Um, now, some cases you could say that the climate change uh, parameter or component is peripheral. So here, these are the cases where references made to climate change is made uh, as a relevant part of the decision, but the arguments of law and the facts uh, primarily concern other issues. So you can see that, again, the, the climate change component is sort of the periphery uh, of, the, of the case. So this could be, for example, cases relating to, and, and examples included in this report, cases concerning deforestation. Um, there could be um, a, a, procedural obligations where governments take decisions on environmental decision making, uh, or could be the appropriate sanctions to be applied or leveled against climate protesters engaged in acts of civil obedience. So this is a very wide range of, of uh, substantive matters, as you can imagine. Now, a third category of cases, which could be a particular interest, I think, when we're talking about international arbitration, are the cases where climate change is sort of incidental. Uh, so it could be relevant, but it's not expi explicitly mentioned. Um, so these are the cases where we see a significant potential uh, to impact on climate change adaptation and mitigation efforts uh, at the domestic level, but when climate change may not necessarily be actually addressed or even mentioned uh, in the award or in the case. And again, I think this is where we will probably will see and that we are already seeing uh, a lot of examples in the international arbitration dockets around the world. Um, and probably both in commercial and investment arbitration. Um, if we're looking at sort of what is known about the transition ahead that we, that we can expect, if we look at, for example, the, the report from the IEA earlier this year on net zero by 20, 2050, um, the IEA predicts that almost half of the reductions to reach net zero by 2050 
are expected to come from technologies that are currently at the demonstration or prototype phase. And if we look at heavy industry and the long distance transport, the share of emissions reductions that will come from technologies that are still under development is even higher. So as there will be a lot of innovation uh, and it will play a lot of an important role in, um, in parallel to other measures, of course, that needs to be taken as we heard yesterday. But in essence, what we're, what we, what we're looking at going forward, we're, we're looking at new technology uh, to potentially deployed in an environment of new and at times volatile policy. We will see many new actors, uh, many of which could also be inexperienced. And we all of this sort of needs to be combined and they need to be working together at very high speed because we don't have much time. So all of this, of course, boils down to a very uh, strong recipe, uh, in my mind, for disputes. Uh, and therefore, we should not be surprised if we start seeing many incidental climate change um, arbitrations, arbitrations going forward. So I think I will conclude my introductory remarks right there. And I will hand over uh, to Wendy, I think, who will continue talking about uh, the many phases of climate change. Thanks, Anna. Alicia, should I kick right off? Yes, okay. So Alicia has asked me in particular to discuss why climate change adaptation and mitigation issues are not already directly arising in investment arbitration or in commercial arbitration in the way that they have done in national court litigation and to some extent in, in international human rights fora. So the, the national litigation, uh, court litigation landscape is, is largely as Annette's met. There's about, um, there's a few hundred, I think around a thousand cases outside of the US now, but the bulk of the cases are still in the US courts. Um, but, but there is now a, a large body of claims out there. A lot of them have been unsuccessful, but some important cases, uh, claimants have prevailed. So unsuccessful for the claimants, I should say. But there's several answers to why we're not seeing the same trends in international arbitration. And the first is the reality that civil society, who are the claimants, or at least bringing the claims or, or assisting to bring the claims in those national court um, litigation claims, they have access to the courts in a way that they do not have access um, to tribunals and international arbitration. So all of these cases, or certainly most of them that I'm aware of, um, have been brought by civil society, either through environmental NGOs, occasionally groups of children, in one case, a group of women pensioners, or affected populations or indigenous peoples. But for um, the recent Dutch case, um, Malay Defense Aid case against RDS, outside of the US and one case in New Zealand, these have pretty much all been claims by communities um, against governments. Um, and those communities are affected by the decision-making of their governments in respect of climate change. And they've pretty much all coalesced around a core principle that the government hasn't ha a a demonstrated a high enough ambition uh, in its climate change um, strategy or the implementation setting of its targets under its nationally determined contribution under the Paris Agreement. So effectively it's communities using tort law um, and more successfully actually constitutional law protections often under the climate change statute that the state has put in place under the Paris Agreement to raise their own government's ambition in their climate change goals. The US claims, which as I said, is where the bulk of the court cases lie, they're a little bit different because there is a bundle of cases by states councils, so local councils of, of the different states or, or cities against energy companies seeking to make those energy companies liable for the cost of adaptation. So for example, putting in place flood barriers um, around the cities. The case in New Zealand, the Smith and Fonterra case is another um, pass at corporate liability. So liability, um, it's by a private citizen, liability against Fonterra, which is New Zealand's main cooperative owned dairy company, but also publicly listed, but also a number of en energy companies and other entities as well. But interesting, New Zealand's 85% um, renewable. It's mostly hydro powered and has been since the 80s. 
that um, the, the emissions come from land use, from agriculture. So Fonterra, a dairy um, producer, was, was a natural um, target in New Zealand. So the cases are founded in tort or administrative or constitutional law, as I said. And we've also seen a proliferation of climate change litigation and environmental claims arising out of planning permit applications or appeals, environmental impact assessments, and new projects. And these two are often brought, at least the intervention um, or the judicial review claims are brought by communities or civil society. An example here in the UK is the Heathrow Airport, Heathrow Runway Extension claim. And then we've also seen a series of um, fair standards or fair trading type claims. So advertising standards claims, con consumer protection type claims. And I expect we'll see a whole lot more of those centered on greenwashing um, allegations uh, as we go forward as, as corporates increasingly setting targets. So these claims are necessarily in national or regional courts or tribunals and not in international arbitration because they don't arise out of a contract or indeed an investment treaty. So the first reason why we don't see these types of obvious climate change mitigation or adaptation claims in arbitration is because the claimants have no standing in the consensual arbitral process to bring those claims. But there's a second reason though, and this is what Annette was getting at. Climate change mitigation and adaptation issues are and have been for some time very much at the heart of what we do in commercial and treaty arbitration, but we don't necessarily see them or see them as that. And this is why Jorge gave us the title of the many faces of climate change. There's many faces that we just don't see. They're there, they're right in front of us, but we don't recognize them. We think of climate change disputes, or we tend to, not everybody obviously, but, but as, as a group, we tend to think of climate change disputes as claims brought by activist, claim, um, claimant, uh, activist claims brought by environmental groups. And I know this because this is the very strong pushback we got with the ICC task force is that people were terrified that we were opening another line of attack. But we weren't, we were recognizing the reality and not just the reality of Jean-Marc's science yesterday, which I too had a sleepless night over, um, but it's always good to have a dose of scientific reality before we um, sort of pat ourselves on the back and think we're doing great good because there's an awful lot that needs to be done before we get anywhere. But the Paris Agreement, I, I propose, the Paris Agreement has changed everything for arbitration, for commercial and for treaty arbitration. It was, it was actually mentioned in the Malay Defence Dutch judgment that although the Paris Agreement is a state party instrument, it was accompanied by a decision of the parties to adopt the Paris Agreement. And at Articles 133 to 134 of that decision, it specifically refers to non-state stakeholders. And it welcomes um, that, that adoption minute, welcomes non-party stakeholders to scale up their climate actions and encourages registration of those actions in the non-state actor zone for climate action platform. Um, and the, the court actually set out in full um, that part of the adoption decision. And then it went on to note that during the 25th COP, COP25 in Madrid, the Climate Ambition Alliance was launched, which was one of the platforms um, under that non-state action. It didn't mention, the court didn't mention the Marrakesh Partnership from 2016, which was the precursor. But, um, but um, in both the Marrakesh Partnership and the Climate action, Ambition Alliance, non-state actors signaled their intention to achieve net zero CO2 emissions by 2050. And then this was all manifested in the Race to Zero platform, which was launched in 2020 and has gained enormous traction in the sector. Now, it bears mentioning that it wasn't um, the defendant and the Dutch cases um, commitment under um, that um, under any of those platforms that the Dutch court alighted on. Um, it, it didn't hold them um, as a non-state party obligated to abide by any voluntary commitments it's, it had made, but rather it required it to make more ambitious commitments um, in order to remove or reduce a danger. So that mentioned that um, adoption decision, it didn't seek to enforce any race to zero commitments against the corporate. 
at the same time, corporates are now racing to commit um, to reduce their own emissions to net zero. And that is driven um, partly due to shareholder pressure um, and risk of divestment, partly due to this litigation we talk about, but primarily it's due to an acceptance of the reality that we are a world in transition. We are moving from one way of living and doing business to another way. And corporates understand that. And they are, for the large part, well into that transition in one way or another. So we're moving systems from the industrial era into the low carbon area. And we're doing so because as a global society, we are finally, finally listening to the science, we're finally hearing the science. And for those of you who listened to Jean-Marc yesterday, you'll appreciate as Annette said that the science tells us we're really not in good shape and we need to make fundamental changes to how we live and work, but also to how our global and financial um, industrial systems function. So corporates setting net zero targets, working towards those, that means investing in new areas and divesting from or retiring down or winding down old areas of investment. And those areas investment are all across the four systems that the IPCC identified for transition, energy, infrastructure and transport, industry, and land use. And the IEA World Energy Report, I think Thomas might have just posted it um, earlier on. Oh, no. Yes, he did. And it posted it. The IEA um, World Energy Report maps scenarios for future energy use and systems. And the press release of that report says the world has a viable pathway to building a global energy sector with net zero emissions by 2050, but it's narrow and it requires an unprecedented uh, transformation of how energy is produced, transported and used globally. And they provide a comprehensive roadmap, but importantly, the roadmap that they provide requires from today, and today was the date of the report, and it was at the beginning of summer, no investment in new fossil fuel supply pro projects, no further investment decisions for new unabated coal plants. By 2030, which is not very far away, no new sales of ICE passenger cars, internal combustion engine. And by 2040, the global energy sector has to have reached, the global electricity sector has to have reached net zero emissions. So we can't be getting our power from anything but um, renewables or, or net zero power supply by 2040. Um, now, there's good news, right? Uh, China announced today that it, it was stopping all investment in any new coal-fired power plants outside of China. And that's fabulous news and should be embraced. It'd be great for them to say the same for inside China, but, but, but baby set. Um, but the thing is, and I think what Jean-Marc really focuses the mind on, and I hope Alicia taped the lecture for people who were unable to attend, we all, the international arbitral institutions, users, stakeholders, we occupy the front line of each and every system that the IPCC and the IEA has identified as requiring this rapid and far reaching transition. Um, so the ICC report, um, you know, the cases come from almost half of ICC's cases come from energy and infrastructure sectors and then um, the next highest percentages, industrial equipment and services, specialized technology that goes into industry and land use, as well as distribution and transport. So all of our work is in this territory, is in this space um, that is undergoing this transition. So the art of the possible lies in the role that international arbitration could play in facilitating or at least not obstructing cross-border transition across public and private sectors. Um, through those systems. And, you know, all the way through mistakes are being made and will continue to be made. And in the words of Rag and Bone Man, we're only human after all. But the way we play our part as international arbitration practitioners, council, arbitrators, experts, institutions, is to make sure that we're fully informed um, that we see those faces, that we recognize them, and that we properly deal with climate change related issues when we're presented with them. So it's not just a subject matter, as Annette said, it might not just be an, a, a coal fired power plant 
it might be um, a distribution contract um, um, or, or sale of goods under international sale of goods um, treaty that that um, raises um, these sorts of issues. So I think we're going to to talk about what what we might be able to do going forward. But I think the challenge in in, in what we have is finding a way that our practice of international arbitration, because it's not really a system itself, but our practice of international arbitration aligns with the current IPCC reported best available science on climate change. I've never seen it even cited in a case, in an arbitration case, that it accords with the greenhouse gas emission targets that are put in place in relation to the operations or investments or established um, as the government policy in response to those reports, and that we apply the national and international laws relating to climate change as those laws emerge and evolve. And we stay on top of those. The same database, and it referred to, also has um, the legislative um, sort of mapping of, of um, the legal landscape. And it's, it's growing and changing all of the time. And if if that's part of your governing law under a contract or a treaty, then you should know it and apply it. And we need to take into account the necessary direction of capital flows in order to achieve transition targets. And we might come back to this, I hope, but we need to think about that most of all when we're quantifying and awarding damages. So there's a huge body of jurisprudence. It's there. It has many faces um, and, um, and we just have to see them and start working them more affirmatively into our practice. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, I don't know if Jorge, uh, you want to add anything to, uh, to on, on this matter? Uh, actually, I think it, 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 it was very full and complete. Uh, I, I perhaps can uh, just offer one, uh, one vantage point on, on in trying to chart uh, all this practice. I think that a threshold has been crossed this year. Uh, and the crossing of that threshold uh, looks pretty much like the following. Uh, for many, many years, uh, actually, for most of the history of environmental law, environmental law has been the law of negative externalities, sort of an, an, additional, an additional layer of law that you had to take into account in conducting, nevertheless, your business as usual. So your business as usual will be affected uh, to some extent, but never the core of the transaction. In this case, we're talking about uh, the transactions that uh, underpin modern life. So food production, energy production, transportation, and shelter, so cement and steel. So the, the, the main sort of step change that I have seen in all this flood of cases is the fact that uh, there is one single case, uh, which is Milieu Defense against uh, Royal Dutch Shell, uh, that I'm not sure if it's going to survive uh, 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 the uh, uh, appeal. But uh, that case has cut very, very deep into the transaction for the first time. Has actually, instead of saying, well, you need to do better, you need to uh, 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 reduce a little bit, use better techniques, here, uh, Royal Dutch Shell is being asked for, in the next 10 years, to reduce by 45% its emissions, scope one, two, and three, which is essentially its emissions arising from itself, its group, and uh, its products. This is going, this is cutting as deep as you can. This is cutting as deep as you can. And this is, we're nowhere near in the, in the, in the era of, I mean, in the, in the practice of investment arbitration. Now, this happened with no new tools. But this happened with the duty of care of book six, six of the uh, uh, Dutch civil code. No new tools. Suddenly they were reinterpreted. Now, those tools are hanging like Damocles swords also in investment arbitration. They are there. But the mindset change has not yet taken place. It will, I think. And it will be a, it will be a surprise for many. But uh, but we can talk about that uh, in a moment. I, I think that's uh, an excellent comment. I, I read uh, 
Earlier this year, th there was an article uh, in the Financial Times that was titled, uh, I, I took the title actually, too many boardrooms are climate incompetent. And it was referring to uh, a study by N the NYU uh, Stern School of Business. Uh, just 7% of board members are climate competent. This is early next year. I think with those types of decisions you mentioned, uh, the uh, percentage, uh, I don't know where, where the 7% uh, comes from, uh, even if it's a uh, uh, study by NYU quoted by the Financial Times, uh, uh, but, but I'm assuming this percentage will raise uh, uh, pretty quickly now in light of the circumstances uh, that the three of you have uh, just described. Uh, so I suggest, because time is obviously running, uh, that we move on to uh, topic number two, uh, which is uh, uh, how is uh, climate change uh, addressed in investment law and arbitration? And, uh, and this is a topic uh, on which some of you may have uh, some familiarity, uh, but we, we, we need to, to set the stage on what the prevailing approach is, the classic approach is, and uh, uh, with maybe a reference to some of your words rendered under the ECT, uh, and, and, and what the new approach is. And I think on this subject, uh, we're gonna have mainly uh, Annette speaking on the, the prevailing and classic approach in arbitration, uh, and uh, Jorge saying a few words on what I call the, the, the new approach with uh, uh, sustainable uh, development obligations or environment cl environmental clauses uh, in uh, new generation treaties, etc. Uh, I'll, I'll let you two uh, tackle the issue. And obviously, uh, Wendy is uh, uh, most welcome to jump in uh, if she strongly disagrees with the two of you. Um, so I'll, I'll let you start maybe, Annette. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, and as um, you have heard that Wendy has very much helped me set the stage for sort of answering the question how climate change can and should be addressed in investment law and uh, arbitration. Um, and I will look at commercial arbitration and investment arbitration, uh, but first looking then at international commercial arbitration, as um, we men have mentioned already, um, there are probably already in many cases and many listening to this call will probably have seen them where you will have what you would then now label as incidental climate change elements uh, in these arbitrations. Um, and um, um, the, 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 the ICC re report or, that, uh, or the commission report that uh, the work, working group that Wendy uh, chaired uh, was also mentioned by Wendy, and then I think it's imp important sort of to, to to go back to that, but really to try and to understand the role of international commercial arbitration and the, the role of international commercial lawyers for that matter. I think it cannot be underscored enough how lawyers can really be sort of at the front line, uh, be front line workers in the transition, and to some extent already are, but may not think of themselves as the front line workers. Um, because if we, again, if we revisit the the system transition pathways foreseen by the IPCC. So we're looking at energy, we're looking at land use, uh, urban development and infrastructure as represented by transport and buildings. These uh, major areas are areas where we see a frequent, frequent use of arbitration all through these sectors, uh, both any investment and commercial arbitration. And again, this was visible in the ICC report uh, chaired where the work was chaired by Wendy uh, uh, on climate change related disputes. And this report was published in 2019. For, so for those of you have, who have not already visited, you should, you should look it up on the ICC website. And it's really interesting what you find in this report. I mean, there are many interesting parts of it, but one element when we're talking about sort of how you can use arbitration is to look at the arbitral institution a statistical overview of cases already at that point. Uh, and sort of looking at economic sector. And when you look at those statistics, it is revealed that a vast majority of cases already uh, relate or could, could be considered to be related to core, and transition area, core, core transition areas. And we heard Wendy talk about that. And uh, there are other institutions in addition to the ICC court that sort of provided statistics to really build that picture of how international commercial arbitration is seeing a lot of these cases uh, already. But so we see a lot of cases in these core transition areas, but another 
detail or another element of understanding what international arbitration is doing and could be doing more going forward is to really go further into the these statistics um, and trying to understand how many of these cases in these areas that have an indirect or direct bearing on climate change. Um, and it, again, it would be very interesting if we could follow that to sort of dig in, into the numbers deeper. Uh, I personally think that uh, the major arbitral institutions sit here on really great treasure uh, to find out more uh, on the societal, societal transition ahead um, and not least trying to uh, understand and learning more of how the private sector is indeed contributing, has contributed in the past and how we can sort of expand, how we can build on that contribution, how, how we can learn from previous uh, experiences to to speed up the transition. Um, so to, to try to see all of these cases where the climate change aspect sort of is present either as an incidental uh, or peripheral element of the case. Um, and the reason why I think it will be valuable to dig down deeper is to really try to answer the questions of if we have a substantive issue that relates to the societal transition in any of these core transition areas that we are talking about, uh, it would be useful to understand sort of what works and what doesn't work. Where, where does policy put um, a, uh, present itself as a problem? Uh, where do we see financial leakage or where do we see carbon leakage for that matter? And trying to understand that. Uh, what industries are at the forefront and what industries are lagging behind? And what do we need, what do we need to do to sort of speed that up? Um, and we can learn a lot from looking at past problems uh, and also looking at sort of the legal structures or, or language of um, simple things like language of the contracts or language, language of the policy, what works and what doesn't work, what presents itself as a problem uh, and how do, you, how do we fix it? And how did the parties try to fix it in this particular example? I have sometimes talked about this as climate change uh, related dispute intelligence. Uh, really to dig down deeper, deeper and to have uh, perhaps a different view on confidentiality uh, in international commercial arbitration when it comes to substantive issues relating to these issues. And it all is from, from the mere fact that we are running out of time. It is, um, it is not business in, in, as usual in the respect that we can sort of close the doors and you know um, we had a problem in our corp corporation and let's be quiet about it and we don't want to share with the competition that we have this problem which is understandable of course uh, if you have the corporate perspective but if we're looking at a bigger systematic perspective if there are similar problems being repeated and these problems if we fix them or if we did not have them at all to begin with that contribute could contribute to having this transition happening faster or innovation being more successful that would be for the greater good for all of us, that would be a good thing. So if we could find a way to share the experiences for the problems, and that's we find that that's what we find in the disputes, that in my mind would be a good thing. Um, so perhaps we should have some sort of a, what do I know, model cost on, on transparency on climate change related disputes. Uh, so I throw that out there. So all those institutional uh, viewers listening, you can take that to your, um, to-do list and see if you can come up with something. Uh, at the SSC uh, in 2019, we published a report that's sort of related to this. We, it's called Green Technology Disputes. Um, green Technology Disputes in Stockholm, I should say. So we were looking then at the, um, the, the, both the commercial cases and the investment arbitration cases in the SSC docket for the past five years, up until 2018, really trying to understand what is the presence of green technology and just we chose the term green technology so that would be sort of any process or product or service that reduces negative environmental impacts in support of the Paris Agreement's target so that was sort of the definition of why we chose green technology um, and there are some really interesting examples when you start digging in the case load where you can see uh, what is happening on the ground um, of something that you could call then the incidental climate change arbitration um, so this includes, for example, sustainable forestry, uh, organic food production, organic waste management, uh, different carbon reduction techniques, and so forth. Um, again, the level of transparency is, is limited in this report because the SSC, of course, as a commercial uh, arbitral institution, is bound by the undertaking on confidentiality towards the users. But um, it tells us 
that there are some interesting things going on in, um, in the commercial side. And again, if we could learn from each other, I'm thinking that would be a good thing. Um, so in this study, we also saw that, uh, and this is not surprising for those of you who had followed the international and treaty arbitration sphere, we saw that uh, in all of the investment treaty arbitrations filed in Stockholm between 2012 and 2018, almost a third, 28% concerned investments in the renewable energy sector. So there you could also see a strong presence of what, what can characterize as green technology. Now, another example of trying to understand what is happening uh, in, uh, in the, in the, in the cross-section, so to speak, between climate change and investment arbitration is to look um, at the, uh, the Energy Charter Treaty. And this is something that we're currently involved in here at the Climate Change uh, Council. Uh, we are conducting a study of awards uh, rendered in the arbitrations filed under the Energy Charter Treaty. And really looking at how these awards and the outcomes of these awards uh, um, either align with or departure from energy transition policy of the states. Um, as of um, this spring, almost 140 investor claims have been initiated uh, under the ECT. And we have seen more than what, more than 70 awards being rendered. So we are trying to assess all of these awards uh, that we can, um, I was about to say, get our hands on <laughs> in the public domain. And we are sort of applying a yardstick to measure the content of, the, of these awards. Again, sort of uh, this, the purpose of trying to understand whether they align or departure from energy transition policy. So the yardstick that we are applying includes a number of questions. Have the awards interpreted the ECT investment protections in their full context? Have tribunals considered the host state's energy policy and its international commitments when assessing and deciding investor state claims? And is the energy transition somehow reflected in the calculation of damages? These are some of the questions we're asking as we are sort of reviewing the awards. And, and again, the objective here is to, under, to increase the, um, the understanding of the Energy Charter Treaty and its interaction with national energy policy in member states, and, and hopefully to be able to contribute uh, with the result uh, of the, over the findings from the study in the ECT modernization process. Uh, and really, the mission here is trying to figure out uh, the, the capacity of the Energy Charter Treaty uh, or the, the non-capacity to support the global um, clean energy transition. Uh, uh, and this is a study that has been commissioned by the Net Zero Lawyers Alliance, again, reflecting um, the, the role of lawyers in a transition and how important it is that lawyers of different um, uh, specializations and backgrounds really chip in and try to understand how the law can be used as an accelerator in this transaction. When we do look at the awards and ask these questions, we look sort of at different levels. We look at the language of the treaty. Uh, we look uh, at the reasoning of the tribunal. To the extent possible, we look, we look of course, at the, um, the arguments made by the parties. Uh, and we look at sort of how um, the, um, the treaty language has been interpreted, for example, by the tribunals. Um, one particular area, uh, which is, I think, interested in the course of the study is the role of applicable governing law in these cases. And I think here, um, although we are still at the early stages of the study, I think this will be a space to watch more closely in the future when it comes to uh, the in future of the interaction between climate change in investment law and arbitration, because I do think here there could be some interesting um, openings here to see what could happen going forward in terms of potentially working with um, the tools that we have. So again, I was mentioned by Roger, no new tools, but see, working with the tools that we have, uh, potentially um, getting um, outcomes that would support uh, the energy transition or the climate change transition that we need to see going forward. So I think I will conclude here and I will hand over to Roger. Thanks very much, Annette uh, and Elisa. If I may, I, I can, I can. I mean, I, I, we have been speaking earlier today with Annette, and, and so we, we, we've heard our stories. And, and it's also with Wendy. I mean, it's, it's not the first time that we're talking about this. I, I know you've been to the competition, <laughs> and, and, I, and I told you not to get injured. It was only a warm up for, for this session. Yes, I mean, the stuff I, is now. 
my fear always is to be repetitive of people who uh, who watched uh, another webinar. But anyways, let, let me let me try to do something a bit uh, different, change a bit the perspective. So again, I, I've been following this uh, uh, environment investment interface for some 15 years. Uh, in some work in 2009, 2008, nine, uh, my I mean my thought was that. Uh, what was going to happen would be pretty much like the following. I said there would be more and more interactions between the two simply because uh, we were facing a lot of regulatory change uh, due to the sustainability transition and that initially investment tribunals would be reductant, sort of risk averse, I would say. Uh, so, and then they would start handling uh, these types of disputes by reinterpreting a little bit uh, basic investment concepts, then at some point uh, they would uh, have to accept that treaties were now different. So they had environmental clauses and so on, and that uh, those clauses would begin by being uh, shyly interpreted and applied and then more assertively applied. And then uh, at some point uh, there would be a, a, a sort of phase in which uh, environmental law would be uh, treated much more like sort of imperative law, so corruption, uh, money laundering, uh, fraud, uh, perhaps competition law. I mean, so we were, we're, we're not yet there, but so far in these 15 years, it has pretty much, uh, it, it has pretty much followed uh, this trajectory, perhaps because I project my own categories when I read it. But the, the, the reality is that right now, we are in a situation where uh, we have most of the practice. I mean, uh, uh, Annette was mentioning uh, the surge in investment arbitration with environmental components. I have counted 178 cases. I know that there are others because I'm sitting in some. So it's 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 really uh, an issue of it's really an issue that is becoming. We have almost a fifth of investment arbitrations that have an environmental component, and over half of that is energy transition. Now. We also know that uh, the amount of environmental clauses has skyrocketed uh, in, in new treaties, FTAs or, or investment agreements, particularly since the mid 2000s, roughly. Now, we're only now, we're only now moving from dealing with environmental protection under the basic concepts of investment law and starting to apply uh, the new tools, the new tools. Uh, we may call it a new approach. Uh, what I'm going to say about the new approach is somewhat disappointing, simply because the new tools have not been used, I guess, as expected. I guess as expected. And when, when a states sit down and suddenly include some environmental language, sometimes hardly thought, sometimes just copy pasted from earlier treaties, uh, they expect that this is going to make a difference. And it has not made uh, a significant difference. So I was uh, mentioning earlier today that uh, if you look at the case law on investment that has actually applied these environmental clauses, you have like three generations of cases. One, which is the old cases, uh, SD Myers against Canada, 2000. Then you have a newer uh, sort of more recent, but still from the last 10 years, you have these cases such as uh, Altamimi against Oman, uh, you have, uh, Spence against Costa Rica, you have uh, uh, Avon against Costa Rica, you have Very Creek against Peru. These are cases between 2014 and 17. And then you have two recent cases, Eco Oro, uh, no, Infinito Gold against Costa Rica and Eco Oro against Colombia uh, under two uh, treaties with uh, Canada. Now these treaties, these, these cases are interesting because what we see in these cases is that council is trying to use a bit more fully the palette of options, but the tribunals are still slightly uncomfortable. And, uh, and I'm going to mention these two cases just to give you an idea of how these, uh, these clauses may operate. But before I give you that idea uh, on, on that these clauses have operated in these two cases, let me restate what I always say and have been saying for 15 years that these clauses can operate at jurisdiction, admissibility, liability, and quantum. In liability, they can operate and they should operate at the level of the primary norm, whether that primary norm has been breached or not, 
how to interpret it, whether it's a presumption of compliance, etc., or at the level of secondary norms, which is whether these clauses are defenses that come into play only once there is a breach. So I have been restating this for years and years and years, just in the, in the perhaps uh, naive hope that it will seep into the, uh, the practice. It's starting to seep slightly, but I think that council and arbitrators could do much better in handling these clauses. There are different clauses, so not every clause will operate in the same way, but uh, these different clauses can be used very differently from what they have been used so far. They are underutilized and underapplied. So those are the, the two terms. Now, now going to, uh, to these two cases that I find very interesting. Uh, in, so these are two cases about uh, uh, extractive industries, gold, and uh, they, they concern measures that eventually limited the uh, exploitation, the, the exploration to some extent, the exploitation of, the, uh, of, uh, of a concession uh, and uh, for environmental reasons. Now, it was not at all at stake. It was not questioned that these were genuine environmental reasons. So this is something important because in the old days, in the old days, in the 2000s and the 1990s, when environmental reasons were invoked, they were always seen as hiding protectionism, hiding some, uh, some motive, some real motive. Today, it is entirely uh, accepted, even by the investor. Uh, and in the rest of the case, it's always the same thing. So there are many cases where the investors are saying, well, uh, I, don't, I don't argue against the environmental motive. I only argue against something else. But the environmental mo motive has, has acquired use soil now. Okay? Now, these cases are, in, in, in one of these cases, one clause uh, uh, was uh, used uh, as a defense against jurisdiction. It's only natural, it's only natural because some of these clauses are drafted in terms that are very similar to tax carve-outs. It was not the case of the particular cross in this particular case. So in Infinito Gold against, uh, against Costa Rica, the clause that the uh, state uh, tried to use as a carve-out for jurisdiction, excluding jurisdiction, so cutting out from the perimeter of the treaty that type of measure. Uh, that clause was a gut-like exception, article gut-like 20 exception that doesn't fit the, the, the purpose because it's a defense for liability. But it's interesting that at least it was used uh, as a carve out because there are many measures, many measures uh, that are environmental measures that fall under uh, the, uh, the clause on non-precluded measures in the same way as you would find uh, measures that are tax measures that fall under these tax carve-outs and they exclude jurisdiction entirely. So we have cases of that in connection with taxation and in connection with national security interests. Not yet the environment, but I think it will come. The first point. Now moving to liability. Uh, on liability, as I was mentioning, you can, you can those, these, these provisions could operate at the level of the primary norm or at the level of the secondary norm. Of course, it's much, uh, is, is very different. Uh, their operation is very different because the burden of proof changes. Also, the level of scrutiny of the arbitrator tends to change because if something has already been deemed to be a breach and you're going to look at an exception, you're going to look differently. Uh, I mean, even if, uh, even if uh, sometimes tribunals leave a, a view of, uh, of vagueness over exactly who has the burden of proving what and what is exactly the level of scrutiny, et cetera. What tends to happen is that when you have already accepted that there is a primary or a breach of a primary rule, you look much more closely to this exceptional justification. So at the primary norm, at the primary role, norm level, it's very important to, to see how these clauses may operate. Now, again, these clauses may operate there uh, as mere guidance for interpretation, uh, which is what the tribunal say in infinito goal, I think, not necessarily correctly. I think that, 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 that there, there are other issues in terms of how it was pleaded. And I will perhaps mention something later on how uh, skeptical literature from NGOs was used to limit the effect of the clause. But the, 
the mere use for interpretation is not necessary. You don't need a clause for interpretation. You have 313C of the Vienna Convention. And in 313C of the Vienna Convention allows you to uh, look at things in the light of the Paris Agreement, uh, UNFCCC, the Kyoto Protocol, the Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol, and many other uh, uh, important environmental agreements. But here it was used as, uh, uh, as interpretation guide. Now, as an interpretation guide, uh, it can have more or less power. In Alta Mim, it had a lot of power. So in the end, the tribunal said that there was no breach of fair and equitable treatment because uh, precisely it could be expected that uh, both parties paid attention uh, to uh, environmental protection precisely because it was a clause and so on. Whereas in Infinito Gold against, uh, against Costa Rica, the tribunal seemed to, uh, to be far more lenient saying that, well, this is just a reminder. This clause is just a reminder that uh, the state has a regulatory power uh, to uh, regulate environmental matters and stay there, roughly, stay there. Very, very inchoate, the reasoning there. Now, there is another way. There is another way at the level of the primary norm, which has been, had been suggested by El Salvador in Spence International against Costa Rica as a non-disputing party. And then it was uh, actually applied, but not very formally, by the majority in uh, Ecuador against Colombia, which is to consider that a different type of clause, in this case, it's an annex, an interpretive annex to the expropriation clause. In FTAs, you have plenty of interpretive annexes. Well, that interpretive annex that said, except in rare circumstances, uh, uh, environmental regulation shall not be an expropriation, roughly. That interpretive annex was a sort of presumption of conformity. So the rule is that the, the, the measure, if it had an environmental purpose, despite the fact that, they, that it caused substantial deprivation, the rule was that it was not a breach of the expropriation clause. The exception was in rare circumstances, which shifts the burden of proof, of course. Now, this is, I think, one of the most valid and, and, and commonsensical uses of environmental causes, and it has, it makes a difference. There is another uh, use of environmental clauses still at the level of liability, which is the uh, question of defenses. Now, again, I'm not talking about general defenses, legality, all the things about admissibility, all those are the other approach, the approach of using the classic investment law concepts colored by environmental considerations. But here I'm talking about environmental clauses. Now, you do have a number of clauses that uh, sometimes are stated as uh, really, uh, the GATT, Article 20 of the GATT, they, they copy paste the, the chapeau and sometimes they cherry pick some of the exceptions. Typically exceptions that are cherry picked are uh, B, D and G, which are the environmental exceptions uh, in the GATT. Now these uh, exceptions, they have been uh, sort of unlucky in their operation. No wonder because even in the GATT, they are unlucky. So it's very difficult to win. Uh, one of those cases. Now, in the case of Eco Oro, what I found interesting, and again, I think it's, it's questionable, is the fact that uh, the tribunal said, well, I mean, this exception could be satisfied, but that would not uh, preclude compensation. And then it quoted Article 27 of the LC Articles on State Responsibility, which is, uh, which applies to, or, or which tends to, tries to preserve or reserve the possibility that there may be compensation in cases of excuse, such as state of necessity, for example, where yes, there is no breach because a breach has been excused, but some compensation would be due potentially. The clause, Article 27, is not saying that that compensation is due. And of course, the GATT like exception is not saying that either. And in the GATT, it doesn't require compensation. There is no compensation in the GATT system, by the way. So the fact that the tribunal says, well, yes, even if it's met, you still have to compensate. It's not necessary. It's not necessary. It's quite to go far out uh, on a limb. Perhaps it was part of the negotiation within an arbitral tribunal, which is, as we know, uh, uh, there is a lot of deliberation and discussion, and sometimes uh, the reasoning has to follow uh, this uh, this uh, this complex process. Now, the last part of this. Uh, uh, of this discussion about these newer approaches, still a bit uh, 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 disappointing in their, in their scope, is 
how to use environmental forces in quantum. Now, I will make two points, one that I made earlier today and another that is fresh. Uh, the, the, the point that I made earlier today is that in Eco Oro, the tribunal said, well, okay, you have uh, an exploration permit. Uh, you could be authorized to exploit, but only if you received uh, an environmental permit. You don't have an environmental permit yet, and the law, the domestic law, uh, includes a precautionary principle, and the precautionary principle states that uh, it's unlikely. So it's under the precautionary principle, it's not impossible, but it's unlikely that you would be granted this uh, uh, environmental permit and you would be allowed to exploit the, the, the area. So the tribunal said, we need to take that into account, uh, and it gave guidance on quantum, but it did not decide quantum. But it said, we need to take that into account because you may simply not be able to pursue this project. That may appear as very innovative, but it's very old because the tribunal in SPP against Egypt had already said that with respect to a tourist resort uh, that was uh, located, that was, to, was supposed to be located in the pyramids, in the pyramid side. And there a tribunal in 1990 said, well, in fact, uh, uh, 1990s, uh, the tribunal said, in fact, uh, I'm not going to give you the money or the cash flow that this investment would have generated for many years, because after just a few years, at the time that the pyramids were listed in the World Heritage Convention list, the investment would not have been possible anymore, would have been illegal. So this is up to when you would get the money, and then you can discount it. Now, that is fairly simple, but it's the same thing for Many, of invest many investments in coal, oil, et cetera, uh, that are trying to recoup these days and saying, well, I mean, as a going concern, I would have received all this money discounted to the present day. But all that money would not necessarily have been received. And this is my second point that comes with the issue of tipping points. You mentioned earlier uh, the issue of tipping points. Tipping points are being used. Uh, tipping points are, are, are a way of dynamics. It's, called, it's what you call a nonlinear dynamics. Uh, in nonlinear dynamics is that at some point there is an incremental dynamics, at some point you cross a threshold and the system overshoots in that respect. So that means that uh, the, the metaphor that I use in simple is that it's a straw that breaks the camel's back. Okay, one straw, the camel is still fine, another straw, the camel is still fine. You put one straw and the camel's back is broken. Now, if you remove all the straws from the camel's back, it is still broken. So it's irreversible, you cannot go back. That's a tipping point. Now, tipping points are not only negative, sometimes they're positive. And there are tipping points in industry. This is what we call disruption. Now, when there is disruption at the economic level, uh, the prospects of uh, the disrupted industries may change dramatically in a very short period of time. Just think about CDs and streaming dramatically in a very short period of time. That is part of what is called fundamental uncertainty in economic theory, in complexity economics, which is not being used at all in expert reports. So expert reports that are trying to assess what is going to be the economic prospects of this or that, they are assuming away that fundamental uncertainty, which is not unprobable. So in the jargon, we call that fat tails. Fat tails means that even events that are very extreme, they still have a fat probability, a non-negligible probability. In a transformation context, that is particularly the case. A transformation context is, is, is uh, fundamental uncertainty is pervasive. And this is not at all being taken into account in expert reports, which are still much more based on, you know, uh, neoclassical uh, economics. So this is something to take into account. I mean, if, if you're uh, on, on, on the side, I mean, it can be taken into account by investors and, and, and experts for investors, and also by states and experts for states, and certainly it has to be taken into account by arbitrators. Arbitrators cannot be uh, uncritical about expert reports. This, are, this is all I wanted to, to share, uh, uh, and I know that I have repeated myself a little bit from what I've been saying uh, elsewhere uh, a number of times.
Uh, I think we need to, to move on unless uh, Wendy has additional comments. The, the structure that I had is actually that uh, Jorge was still uh, speaking on the next topic, no, topic number three, but then there's the topic of uh, proposals on which I know also that uh, Wendy has a lot to say uh, as well. Uh, so uh, I don't know if Wendy, if you, you want to comment on, on this topic we've just addressed, so we, we move on to topic number three. Okay, so I'll, I'll still give the floor to, to Jorge and obviously uh, you, Wendy, and, uh, and Annette can, uh, can rebound on whatever George is going to say. I don't know uh, on this topic, which is topic number three, uh, which was concerned with specific examples of climate change investments or, or disputes. There's a couple of, uh, when we prepare this, uh, this webinar, uh, there's a couple of uh, uh, specific issues we, we discussed. Uh, one was the the the, card, the, 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 uh, the EU uh, the European Commission carbon border adjustment uh, mechanism that's uh, very fresh from uh, from July, uh, and possibly uh, the two sides of climate change disclosure requirements. I don't know if you want to tackle both or just one of them. Uh, bearing in mind that uh, it'd be good that we try to do it in roughly 20 minutes, uh, so that we have enough time. Uh, for Wendy to go on with proposals and, and possibly if we can uh, uh, questions. Thanks, Alicia. I'll just use five and, and, and perhaps we can, because it's good to improvise a little bit and it's, it would be good to, to sort of cross chat with, uh, with Wendy and Annette as well. But the, the um, so let me just talk about the CIVAM issue. Now, uh, CIVAM, the term CIVAM, as many in the, the audience will know, it's, it's a carbon border adjustment measure. Uh, a carbon border adjustment measure is typically uh, a trade-related uh, climate uh, policy. Why is that? Because if you're in a jurisdiction that has a carbon price, that means that uh, the producers in that jurisdiction, they have a highest, a higher cost of carbon. And if you, within that jurisdiction, you import products that do not face a similar high cost of carbon, then there would be problems of competition. Now, how do you put producers elsewhere which do not face the same price of carbon and producers here, in this case, here is a European Union, how do you put them uh, on a level playing field at the level of carbon costs? Now, there is a lot of talk, but uh, essentially in 14th of July, the uh, European Commission uh, issued, after having leaked uh, one draft that was slightly, slightly, slightly different, but fundamentally similar, uh, leaked this uh, draft regulation to impose uh, uh, carbon border adjustment measure on uh, cement, iron, steel, fertilizers, and electricity, roughly. Uh, now, that's why is that interesting from the perspective of, uh, of investment? Well, just imagine that you're a producer in the European Union, and you use those elements that I just mentioned as inputs. Now, you could use those elements as inputs, and some of those inputs, you may be importing them from elsewhere because they're cheaper, instead of buying them in the EU. If now they are no longer that cheaper because the price has gone up due to the border adjustment measure that you have implemented on those imports, then that means that you have you as a producer inside the European Union selling your products a competitive disadvantage. This is particularly the case if uh, the goods that are in competition with yours, which are manufactured goods, are not subject to the CIVA, which right now are not subject to the CIVA. So you see that your price, is, your, your cost goes up. Uh, you're not uh, placed in a level playing field by the CIVA, it's CIVA itself. So what can you do? Well, you can bring an action. You can bring an investment claim saying that the measure is a measure that uh, has dramatically changed your production cost. This is not new. There have been in the past uh, uh, trade-related investment claims. Uh, in Canada, for example, S.D. Myers was a trade-related investment claim. Uh, there have been others. And this happens because production now, uh, in most, in many cases at least, production is based on a global supply chain. So it's not production only here, but production relies on uh, a range of, uh, of steps that come from abroad, and that may be affected by trade-related measures. 
So the point that I was uh, simply making, and this is my last, my last word on this, is that as we see here again, a trade policy is a, a trade policy that not only relates to climate change, but it's also directly affecting potential investment. I mean, directly affecting investment and potentially uh, being a source of investment claims against whom, that's a big question, whether it's going to be against the EU itself, for example, under the uh, Energy Charter Treaty or against uh, states in their implementation acts under some bilateral investment treaty. Thank you, Jorge. Uh, I don't know if Wendy or Annette, you, you want to rebound on this, or if George wants to, Jorge wants to add something on climate disclosure requirements, uh, because we, we, we sort of caught up a bit on time, uh, but, but we, uh, uh, we, we also need to be efficient, obviously. Let me just say, Alicia, if I may, CBAM is just one carbon pricing tool, right? And the, the carbon pricing mechanisms are gaining momentum. The IMF maps a really nice world map of all the carbon pricing mechanisms that we see, and they generally fall either into a carbon tax or into an emissions trading scheme. And both of those can, and then in the latter case, have give rise to investment treaty claims, particularly if the investment agree or contractual claims, if the underlying investment treaty or uh, uh, if the underlying investment agreement or expectation has tax stabilization provision. So it's, it, it, it's going to be very, very interesting to see how the legitimate expectation arguments play um, by the states in those cases. And the Coke um, case, we know it's been brought, we don't know, um, we don't, it's not public though, um, but that's, that's going to be an, an interesting, um, um, interesting sort of decision on the retirement, early retirement of, of um, ETS credits. I'm sorry, Wendy, the, the Coke case, it's the Coke brothers? Uh, yeah, yeah, oh. against Canada. Yeah, okay. yeah, uh, against Ontario, well, against Canada, but it's state of Ontario um, um, wound up their emissions trading scheme and they'd invested in a huge amount of um, um, units. Um, but, you know, with the, with the uh, acceleration and amplification of voluntary carbon markets and the commensurate um, sort of government pricing, we, we're going to see a huge amount more regulatory activity in this space. In fact, the ICC, not the arbitration part, but the um, ICC Tax Commission is an environmental commission is putting out renewed updated principles on um, carbon pricing, um, you know, trying to encourage it done in the right way for the right reasons. So <laughs> we need to be mindful that left hand knows what right hand's doing in terms of those working in international trade and investment from, from investment structuring end through to dispute resolution end. And that's not always the case, unfortunately. We don't have enough Jorge's. Uh, thank you, Wendy. Uh, since I, I, although I said uh, earlier on uh, that our, the, our proposals would be modest in light of our role as uh, arbitrators and we're not policymakers, obviously, we, we still have uh, proposals because uh, I, I think it's uh, Gramsci who said, uh, uh, the the pessimism of the thoughts and the optimism of the will or something like this and and we have to look forward with proposals and I know you Wendy uh, had a lot of proposals to address uh, climate change disputes in arbitration uh, in uh, uh, in uh, in uh, in some innovative fashion so that we actually take into account uh, 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 the, 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 the physical uh, constraints uh, that we have around uh, uh, in relation with uh, uh, climate change. So maybe I'll, li I'll leave you the floor and we can all react on this uh, later on uh, before, if we have a bit of time opening the floor uh, for potential questions. Okay, I'll, I'll put some ideas out there for discussion because it'd be really hear, interesting to hear the discussion because none of these are, are um, you know, novel to me and not, none of them are necessarily my ideas, but rather just, just picked up in, in conversations and listening to what's going on and watching closely what's going on in the space. And many of them um, Jorge's already talked about. So first of all, um, there's the 
sort of regulatory environment that um, could be on a pathway towards a regime of enforcement that starts to look very similar to bribery and corruption. And we talked about this in the, um, the side event that um, Annette, the SCC and IBA and um, ICC and the PCA did before COP21 in Paris. And the OECD legal director at the time came in and, and, and spoke about that. Now, we're a long way from there. Um, we're an awfully long way from a transnational compliance regime for net zero commitments that looks anything like the bribery and corruption, corruption regime that we have under the US FCPA or POCA or the Bribery Act in the UK. But with the French vigilance law already in place and mandatory climate risk reporting coming in to force in the EU and the UK already in force in New Zealand. I think we are in that direction of travel and it just become it just becomes a question of how um, how it's applied, how it's interpreted. But even if it didn't quickly reach the level of FCPA and and bribery act and pocket this sort of transnational obligations with with frankly, criminal um, consequences if, if you don't comply. These vigilance laws, these mandatory um, reporting laws are, are laws, right? They're not soft laws, they're not TCFD. These are laws, these are, are, are being incorporated into the governing law. And if that happens to be the law where the investment takes place or the law governing a contract, then, um, or mandatory environmental laws or carbon laws of a place um, of part performance, you know, those tort laws, those constitutional protections, they, they already bring those issues into the room before we get to, you know, an equivalent of a, a bribery act or an FCPA. And I think that's what Jorge was saying as well, if I'm understanding him right. So um, I, I think we, you know, a couple of things. First of all, linking to what Jean-Marc said yesterday. It's not the time to be dancing around these issues and thinking, you know, maybe this, maybe that, maybe in 10 years. We haven't got 10 years, right? So, so it's, it's what our cases look like today, our cases that we're sitting on as counsel today, our cases that we're advising on today, our cases that we're sitting on as arbitrators today. And it's actually accepting the reality that the legal landscape has moved so fast in the last 18 to, to 24 months um, that governing law of almost any contract will look a little bit different today um, or mandatory law of place of performance could look a little bit different today to what it might have looked two years ago. And I think we have to start factoring that into our thinking and putting that brick in our brain. And that's why I like the bribery and corruption sort of comparable, because there was a time when international arbitrators didn't really think about that. And when parties didn't, you know, I'm talking a few decades ago now, but and when parties didn't really raise it because both sides had a self-interest in not raising it. And I think it's now pretty much accepted that if an arbitrator feels there are red flags, the arbitrator raises it. Um, are we there on, on climate change um, objectives? No, but you know, I'm looking to see the, the arguments that exist under the governing law being run. Um, and as Jorge says, the, the, you know, lawyers are clever people. You can run those arguments to suit either side of a case and, and, and use them to win. Um, but, um, but I do think getting that brick in the brain is really important. Um, so that's on the bribery and corruption. In terms of the, the science, um, I, my own personal view, it's only my view, is I don't think historically lawyers have done well with science. <laughs> and, and, um, I, I, and I also just personally don't think we are built that well for systems thinking. I think we are, by selection, when we become lawyers, we're analytical. By our training, we're taught to be more analytical. And analytical, the peeling down to the very base of a problem, is the opposite of systems thinking, which is 
you know, spanning out and looking at the component parts of all the different issues. So, you know, I think I think the whole IPCC approach mindset, the whole systems transition or systemic thinking, we use the word a lot, but I don't think we necessarily um, fully understand it the way the scientists do. Um, and that's if you pull a piece here, a piece over here will we'll have a have an effect and you need to think about that. So, so I, I do think it's time for all of us in international arbitration, be it commercial or treaty, to become a lot more familiar with what's happening in the trade environment, um, in the supply chain, um, and, and, and how these transitions are actually occurring within the economic and financial system. Um, but in terms of the science itself, um, we need to find a way to get the science to decision makers. And I'd say this for courts as well as tribunals that doesn't pass through the adversarial cross-examination process to such an extent that there's nothing left at the end of it. So we, we, we can't be undermining the IPCC science as uh, the, the, the reports that report the science. Um, we can't be undermining that in our enforcement of um, investment protections and, and contractual rights and obligations. We need to respect it, treat it respectfully, understand it well, make sure it's not overstated and make sure it's not understated. And we need to find a way to do that. And I'm, I'm quite keen on finding a way to resurrect the legitimacy of amici briefs <laughs> that, could, that could see some, some form of IPCC expert panel that's just available to come in and help tribunals or help courts mutually appointed by the parties. Um, so so the, the science um, I think is pretty pretty useful and pretty valuable um, um, place to think about doing things in a different way. And then I, I, I also think, and I'll stop on this, um, I, I have always been um, you know, a great advocate of international arbitration. It's, it's been my livelihood, but it's also been my community and my life for two and a half decades. Um, and I believe in it as a, as a process, as a mechanism. Um, and one of the things I like about it so much is it's, it's, its bones are very basic, but you can build onto it or into it whatever you want um, to, to create sort of bespoke systems. And we have systems like ICANN and, um, um, you know, the top level domain name systems. And we have different, different um, sort of bespoke arbitration systems for um, certain industries and certain disputes within certain industries. And I think there are several places for that in relation to climate change disputes. So if you just take voluntary carbon markets as one, you know, there's a huge push and been an enormous amount of multidisciplinary work going on this year to really scale up voluntary carbon markets. Now, when that happens, there's going to be disputes at every level from the core carbon principle setting to the accreditation of standard, standards bodies to the, um, to the setting of standards to the um, you know, accreditation of, of um, project assessors right through to you know, sort of four layers before you even get to assessing a particular project and deciding whether or not to grant carbon tradable units from that project. And then there's the monitoring of the lifetime of the project and the retirement. And then the whole carbon system is on a declining, sort of transitioning out process anyway. So all of that requires someone to understand that whole system. And the um, recommendation of all these scaling up task forces is that every single contract is governed by arbitration, but just a bog standard ICC or similar clause, which is, you know, what we generally recommend as a first start. But I think here you need much more um, bespoke facility for very quick resolution if it's a secondary trade, if, you know, if it's under a master trading agreement on the secondary exchange or um, understanding of how the core carbon principles apply across the system. So there's a lot of embedded knowledge that the people who work in these carbon markets really know well. And frankly, they would be a better body of arbitrators to resolve disputes under that system than, than perhaps um, the, the normal people that would come out of the um, institutions that they're naming in the clauses. 
Um, and another area that, that is similarly open, another example is in relation to technology sharing. So we um, are, are starting to see that there is um, potentially scope if some of the people listening might've been involved in standard essential patent disputes um, and there's um, which are um, under licensing agreements and fair and reasonable pricing fair reasonable non-discriminatory pricing formula disputes now that sort of technology licensing and that sort of um, pricing formula could be applied in the climate technology sharing space in order to try to facilitate greater sharing of technology which is one of the big obstacles we have to transition and um, and again, a specialist body of arbitration that perhaps has an expert determination at first level, and then a standing body of experts that are, um, you know, obligated to undertake ongoing training and um, and and proper, you know, sort of assessment and and testing to make sure that they actually understand the underlying systemic subject matter. I think could be really useful. I think we're up to it, right? I think international arbitration has stepped into the breach in some pretty awful times in history over the last few hundred years. And I think, you know, we're as well-placed as any mechanism. I think we're a community of, of really good people who, who are intellectually curious and who are also incredibly responsible. So I, I think there is a lot that this community can achieve with the subject matter that is right in front of us. Those many faces that are sitting right there. There is a lot that this community has in terms of tools and expertise and creativity and innovation at its disposal um, to, to actually run into this and tackle it head on and not just dance around the edges about it. Thank you, Lady. Uh, thank you, Wendy. I, I, I fully agree. I must say, uh, regarding how well prepared we, we may or may not be, I think with all of the information that, that is on the internet and on Sears websites, and this is personally how I came to, uh, to invite uh, Jean-Marc Jancovici. Uh, Jean-Marc Jancovici, he teaches at uh, uh, L'Ecole des Mines, which is one of the very top engineering schools in France. He has a, a 20 or 22 hour uh, class that's available on the, on the, on the web uh, on energy and climate change, uh, explaining the, the physics, the chemistry, the geology, the topography, uh, all related elements of the science uh, that actually took online because it's, it's free, uh, uh, it, it's been made available. It's in French, so uh, I don't know how many French speakers we have, but I'm quite sure uh, many engineering schools, uh, wherever you may be located, today have uh, this type of class uh, for, uh, uh, for engineering students. Uh, I, I cannot imagine that there'll be any engineering school in the world uh, today that would not be teaching that to engineering students, uh, which is very important because the engineers, they're the ones who make the link between the science and the practical applications in the economy. And I must say myself, uh, those 20 hours, I think if anybody took that, ty that type of, uh, of, of training, which is not a lot, uh, and you can do online yourself, it's, it's extremely helpful. And in particular, uh, it helped me understand personally, um, one of the comments that uh, Jorge was uh, making earlier on the fact that uh, when he was talking about experts, uh, um, uh, everything was still hinging, or a lot at least, on, uh, I think you said, the neoclassical uh, economic theory, if I remember correctly the expression you used. Uh, and at the end of the day, I think it's something that's really missing. It's the direct dialogue between lawyers, experts, forensic experts in particular, and engineers, uh, not necessarily people who are going to be involved in arbitration, uh, so that we understand the physical representation of reality. And what, what I mean is that, uh, and yesterday there was very striking Jean-Marc's uh, uh, presentation. Uh, basically, he, he basically said that uh, uh, the, 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 what we call the economy, uh, in essence, it's just a physical system of extraction 
and transformation of natural resources uh, in which the economic models basically only count two cost factors. One is the cost of labor and two is the cost of capital. Uh, but then there's another cost that's never taken into account, which is the cost of natural resources and of a stable climate system that's enabled us to build up the, the modern world, which were giving us, given to us for free by nature. Uh, and, and this is something that is not factored seriously in economic models right now. And I think this is really something in uh, assessing damage, mod, damage uh, novels, uh, damage damages uh, models and, uh, and 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 linking economy engineering and the law, uh, where I think we should find forums to have more uh, direct discussions uh, between engineers, uh, economists, uh, experts, and and, and lawyers, uh, and, and I think it's very difficult uh, not to do that if we want to sort out issues because at the end of the day, the BITs they are what they are. Uh, whether they're new generation treaties or old generation treaties, you always have uh, defenses of public policies or arguments to be made. Uh, and then you have to fill those clauses and those arguments uh, with an understanding of the, 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 physical, um, the, the physical reality. And, and, and this brings to mind, uh, and I see my friend Thomas Lehmann has been posting uh, a lot of the links uh, on uh, on the on the chat uh, for people to uh, to uh, to know about uh, uh, some of the information that was provided by the the, the speakers, uh, but this makes me think about uh, uh, the Vattenfall case, uh, uh, where at the you know a few months ago, uh, it's a case about Germany that decided uh, um, a few days after the Fukushima case in 2011 literally a few days that it would uh, phase out nuclear energy much quicker uh, than, than initially thought. Uh, uh, and, uh, and this generated this case brought by Vattenfall and other, uh, other uh, uh, investors uh, in the energy sector uh, uh, in Germany to, to sue under the ECT uh, uh, Germany. And we won't know what the, uh, the award will look like because uh, most likely there will be no award given that the case was settled. In theory, I think the, the, the settlement still needs to go through uh, uh, EU state aid approval. So in theory, the case could resume, but pretty much it's, it's quite unlikely. Uh, but from what I understand, uh, you're talking about phasing out uh, an industry which was uh, in, in uh, an energy generating facility, which was nuclear power in Germany, completely, uh, actually much quicker than much, much quicker than, than coal. And the issue was not really, climate change was not really debated by the parties. Should the arbitral tribunal said, well, um, uh, would the parties be willing uh, to talk about the issue? And if they don't, uh, at least maybe the, 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 the award could mention that the issue was raised that the parties uh, maybe did not want to discuss. And I say this, and I'm not an activist myself, but I really think that if we had an award, and again, I don't know what the award would have looked like. Uh, I was not attending the debates uh, and, uh, and I'm not fully aware of all the questions that were asked, but I understand the issue was not really raised. And 20 years from now, with an award on the case of phasing out nuclear power, uh, if you had an award rendered on this very specific issue and not a word would be said on, the, on climate change, on the impact of that measure, 20 years from now, that would be really odd for some, someone looking back at the case. So I think in general terms, when you're thinking about uh, um, investment disputes and uh, uh, in particular, phasing out certain types of facilities and new new uh, regimes that, that change the deal for investors. Uh, I think we should try to build a, a systemic test uh, that would take into account, you know, climate change, biodiversity, uh, because obviously, whenever you take a, a new a new measure, uh, you also have to look at uh, the extent of land use per unit of energy produced the impact on plant and animal life in a defined geographical area, uh, whether we have the available uh, natural resources to pursue a particular technology or not, and where are those natural resources 
uh, located. They're not necessarily easily accessible and they're, and, and they're not necessarily uh, uh, sufficient. Uh, and, and of course, looking at the impact on, uh, uh, of, uh, on health uh, for potential measures, for instance, in Germany, uh, phasing out nuclear means for a certain time uh, that you'll have a lot more coal, in particular uh, lignite, uh, which basically is the most harmful coal to, uh, to human health. So when you have those type of measures, we should be open uh, to, to thinking about those and see what is raised by the parties, what can be raised by the arbitrators. We're not pleading the case for the parties, but I think we have to be cautious about the fact that a few years from now, uh, uh, what we write in awards will be read will be read by future generations, uh, and, and we have to be aware of all of those uh, uh, all of those issues uh, in order to deal them appropriately. Uh, and that's why I, I think the dialogue uh, with engineers, a direct dialogue, is very necessary uh, because they're the ones who can tell you through a rule of three to give you the orders of magnitude of what type of uh, uh, technology will work or will not work. Uh, and we all, uh, and by that I mean, within the very limited uh, time frame that we have, uh, we, 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 we don't have a lot of time. Uh, so so my, 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 main, my, my main concern really today uh, is that I think we, we need to organize a, a forum where, where those discussions can be held directly uh, uh, between, uh, between uh, all of those actors, uh, because I don't want an engineer to read my award and say, well, how come your word doesn't talk about this particular issue? Uh, and, and, and I think really this is something that, uh, uh, that I'm convinced we should be uh, pushing for. Uh, I, I don't know, um, I finished my rant on this. I, I don't know if somewhere, someone wants to add anything else uh, on, on, on those possible uh, uh, views for, for, for the future. The, um, I'm looking forward to seeing uh, the first case under the public policy um, of the uh, state of enforcement under the New York Convention challenge to one of these commercial awards or treaty awards under the UNSTRA rules. Um, so, you know, there is certainly a, a sort of further place of regulation potentially. Um, and when Patrick Tiffry and I raised this during the um, ICC working group, we got, you know, severely told off and that that was ludicrous. But I think, you know, 2017, that working group started um, I think now sitting, looking at the world as it is, you know, sort of end of a pandemic, um, public policy sort of challenges to an award that is wholly inconsistent um, with, you know, trying to have a planet for the future of our children. Maybe there is a way under, if the public policy is, is there in the enforcing state, in the, in the state where the courts are for the enforcement. I don't know. Um, so it could be interesting. So there is, you know, we forget that our awards, there is a vetting of our awards. And once you're in public policy territory, that's where some of the um, early sort of fraud, bribery and corruption awards got picked up. Um, you know, I, I, I look forward to seeing if that's ever utilized. Uh, if I can just add, because I think what you're saying, Eliseo, is really interesting, and it's sort of an example of what Wendy was asking for in systems thinking uh, from the lawyers. Um, um, and I think just as a reflection on what we have heard, uh, both from, from, all, from all of the speakers, from my colleagues here on the panel today, is really there's a lot of expertise, there's a lot of skill out there they, that may not be fully utilized in in a legal setting. So in terms of, we have heard Shorsha talk about the experts uh, and what kind of methods are being implied in relation to what methods there are. We've heard when they talk about sort of what kind of laws do you refer to and what do you bring in the IPCC or do you bring in the UNFCCC? And I think um, there's a lot of sort of potential in, in using the expertise and using the tools out there. And we heard not least you earlier talking about 
how we need to have sort of the views of the engineers involved. And, and it sort of also comes back to this fact that we, we, um, th there is this tradition that's not unique for law. That's, I think that's a societal tradition to, to a large extent that we sort of organize ourselves in different silos and we become experts in our respective silos. But it's when you move between the silos, that's when you have some really interesting things happening. Um, and I've stolen this quote from someone else who came up with it, but I do think that innovation lurks sort of in the darkness between the silos. That's when the interesting things happen. And law is not a law of physics in the sense that it's the law of nature. So it's, it's set in stone, right? Um, that's not the nature of law as in legal law. <laughs> it is decided by humans, it's decided by governments. Uh, and it is deciding by how it's being applied and it evolves. And it, so it's, it is to some extent, and you could call it a moving target. Um, and all of the actors uh, in, in the legal universe um, have, um, I suppose one could call it a responsibility to see what is, what is the role, what is what, uh, what you're doing right now in the, in the bigger picture. And how can you contribute? And, and I do think that by bringing in the different skills and the different expertise and doing it in a new way, that's how we move things forward. That's how we move the needle. Um, so I think it's very encouraging that, we, that we're able to, to have these conversations and really to have all these ideas developing um, to move things forward, um, because that's what we need to be doing. Uh, and if I can just add one thing when it comes to future disputes, um, an additional element, because we've heard, uh, we've talked a lot about speed and the need for sort of things are happening, things need to happen quickly. And, and I do think that also relates to the way we resolve traditional disputes. Um, because if, let's say it is a dispute that has anything to do with this, the societal shift, that it has anything to do with the technology or the, the, the great shift that we need to have happening, then we might find ourselves in a situation where we, we do not have the time to wait for the full-fledged time that it usually takes to settle uh, an arbitration case, a complex arbitration case. We might need to reconsider using other tools also for the dispatch resolution. So there are many tools out there that um, supports a fast resolution of disputes. And, uh, and there are specific situations when they are very valuable but we could add to that list of advantages of these tools. So that could be mediation. It could be, we have now in Stockholm, this new instrument called the SSC Express. So you have expedited arbitration, fast track arbitration. You could add to the list of why these different tools are valuable. The fact that they relate to climate change um, adaptation and mitigation measure, because the mere fact that they do, that would be an argument for, for being faster than usual and therefore go for that particular dispute resolution method, I, uh, I would think. So uh, we should take that with us as we choose or advise clients on what avenue to choose when going for a specific dispute, dispute resolution um, option. Jorge, Wendy, you want to add anything or? No, just say to say that the um, the the um, expedited proceedings or multi-tiered proceedings, um, and also different ways to deal with costs, get the expertise of the tribunal. There, there are a lot of the tools that we um, sort of tried to tease out a little bit in the in the ICC report. But um, I, I echo everything Annette says about um, um, you know thinking about using those thinking about approaching cross-examination a bit different and I you know thinking about talking to your valuation experts about perhaps moving off the DCF for the coal mine that hasn't yet broken ground you know I mean maybe there's a more appropriate valuation model and if two DCFs is all the tribunal gets it's going to be nervous to do anything else and it's it's um it's just not real um for for you know anyway um so so yeah um but but certainly i think just be a bit brave in individual proceedings as as annette says there's lots of tools at our disposal or maybe a better way to put it is is just don't be lazy uh and i think that this this comment about not being lazy is uh is uh, is essential because uh we must remember, and we speak of intangible laws of physics and the laws that are moving targets, 
It's the first time in history that we're gonna have this clash. And we know at the end of the day, we cannot act as if physics is going to adjust to whatever economic policies and legal systems we, we want to devise. So this is why I urged a, a direct dialogue uh, and for every bit with engineers, scientists uh, and lawyers not to be lazy, as you said, Wendy, it takes, doesn't take that much time. You're never going to be as a lawyer because we're, we're different, uh, we have a different mindset. We, uh, I'm speaking for myself, I suck at math, uh, but, 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 uh, but, but everybody involved needs to spend 20 or 30 hours to educate itself. And it's, it's not hard to do it. The information is out there. And, and, and over a few months, everybody has the, the time to do it. And also believe uh, uh, in the effect of imitation when you're following uh, national policies to fight climate change uh, in the different countries, even in the EU, there are huge differences between the countries. And, uh, uh, and just to give an example, I've, I've been following quite a bit the Netherlands recently. And maybe it's because, I don't know, it's the pragmatic people, obviously. And maybe it's because uh, they have rising sea levels that threaten them quite, uh, quite quickly. Uh, but in terms of public policy measures uh, domestically, they've taken very interesting moves that were very different uh, from uh, from uh, from uh, other countries in the EU, uh, that I found uh, when I when I read what I knew about the science, I thought, well, this is a good example to start recon uh, a reconciliation between the science, the public policy, and the economics. And at the end of the day, what we'll be uh, doing in arbitration. Uh, um, Gambia also has a small country in in Africa, 2.3 million people. Uh, very interesting public policy developments when you compare them to the science. Uh, and, and we all have to be uh, curious about this because this will inform uh, uh, our decisions as counsel who will be pleading a case uh, and, as, uh, and as arbitrators who will be uh, rendering an award and as uh, scholars who will be uh, writing uh, uh, treaties because we, we must not forget uh, that uh, 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 what we write today, 20 years from now, will be read by other people, uh, and we have to be not lazy, as, uh, as, uh, as uh, was just said by, by Wendy. I, I'm afraid we've uh, sort of eaten up our time, and we don't really have time for questions. Um, and I'm very sorry about this, because uh, uh, it, it, is, uh, it is very different, so it's difficult sometimes to keep on schedule with uh, uh, so many uh, interesting comments and perspectives and, and people obviously have uh, constraints and there, there are many events. I think there are 75 events and people also have to go back to work. So I'm very sorry again, uh, not to be addressing uh, any questions by the, the audience. My apologies again. Uh, we will be uh, uh, making available uh, a recording, a replay of this event. Uh, I, I will try to do that sometime next week. Uh, uh, I hope before the end of next week. Uh, be patient. As I said, we'll have work to do. And <laughs> after the Paris Arbitration Week, we also need to, to do that. Uh, but I'll be sending that to all of you. Many thanks for your attention. Uh, uh, it was very interesting for me to, to hear all of our speakers. And, and I'm very grateful to the members of the audience uh, who really uh, registered from all four five continents. Uh, on different time zones, so I'm, I'm very thankful for that. Many thanks. Have a have a good uh, afternoon or a good night wherever you may be located. Bye bye.